Constitution Architect here at Dundas. I've been working at Dundas for about eight years now, and during that time, I've been asked to dashboard just about everything. I built dashboards in every industry, healthcare, manufacturing, HR, finance, you name it, I've probably dashboarded it, if you can consider that a word. Uh, in fact, uh, looking back at one of my more outrageous dashboard projects, um, we actually created a product for a large farm that wanted to help track the production of their dairy cows. End of the day, uh, we had actually created a fully interactive dashboard that allows us to both see the production in certain areas of that farm and actually drill down and see pictures of the cows. Wild, huh? I could go on forever about some of the many things uh, both myself has seen and our professional service department over the years, but I'll spare you that for now. Realistically, it doesn't matter what you do in your day-to-day -day business. Everybody has reporting, and visual reporting is a lot more effective than textual reporting. Today, I'm going to show you some ways of viewing different dashboards and some different in interesting visualizations. By the way, the concepts that I'm showing you today, uh, we can certainly help you implement any of these if you've got them, whether you're an existing client or someone who's just never seen Dundas before. Hopefully, there's something here that will be new to you. Now, let's get right into it. So a brief agenda. Uh, I'm going to take you through a quick performance dashboard, uh, show you just some different ways to view dashboards, and I'm going to jump into maps a bit, something that tends to get ignored a lot, and there's some certainly interesting concepts there. Show you some charts, uh, and then just a few other goodies, as you can see. So again, I don't want to waste too much time in the intro. Let's get to the meat. So one of the most common things that we end up building at Dundas is what's called a performance dashboard. It's basically what you're seeing here. And the whole concept behind a performance dashboard is that you've done the homework. You already know what the users need to see. You know, you research who the end user is going to be. And I'm presenting information directly to them to help them do their job. Now, before I dig in a little bit too far into this one, I want to take a second to explain what's going on in the middle of the screen here. I absolutely love this visualization. I think it's worth explaining. So this is a call center dashboard. And what the, one of the things they're actually measuring here is average handle time. So think about it. If you call your cell phone company, how long is that rep on the phone with you? Realistically, they want to have that average handle time as low as possible. Answer your question, get off, help the next person. Instead of just showing an average, what we're doing here is we're actually showing for an entire day all the different calls or web chats that took place. So you can see that the square represents a call, the triangle represents a chat. And you can see, based on the scale, the duration of each one of those events. So instead of just telling me my average was 20, I can now see the entire day worth of activity. And maybe I want to ask Delia here, hey, what was this 56 minutes uh, web chat that happened? Maybe this is something that I can do to help her do a better job uh, in her day-to-day -day life. It's just a type of question that's difficult to answer. That sort of thing gets hidden if you just show an average. So by dispersing it like this, I could actually go, I could drill down. Maybe I want to see who the customer was, the exact problem, anything. Anyway, a little bit of an aside, uh, but let's get back to the whole performance dashboard idea. As I said earlier, you're really just looking at KPIs here, key performance indicators. We know what the user wants. We present it directly, as I said. There's not a lot of room here for the user to go and change things. Again, we already know what they want. Uh, I can certainly come in and see maybe different days worth of data, but it's still the same dashboard that we're presenting, or even different filters in this case. And that's really what's going to start uh, what I wanted to show you here, is maybe some different ways to view dashboards. So I'm going to show you alternatives. Not always do you have a case where it's you know, a few clearly defined key performance indicators that you need to show. Sometimes you may have just a lot of performance indicators in general, not necessarily key, that your users need to see. And it's kind of uncomfortable, burdensome, sorry in order to have everybody have everything on one dashboard. So I'll show you some options. First thing you can do is something called mashups. And what this is, this is actually the ability for an end user to come in and pretty much design their own dashboard. You see at the bottom of the screen, we've got all these different sections. These are basically predefined mini dashboards that you're seeing here. We call them dash blocks. And you see, I can actually drag and drop these onto the screen as an end user. So there's no development required here. And you see, as I add more and more, they will start to fill up the screen. So it really allows me to customize what I want to see on here. The other thing that's great about this view is that you can actually have it tied to security. So if you've got several different departments or just different levels of people, uh, as I log in, I see only the dash blocks that are relevant to me. 
and not everybody else's. You can also see there's a search functionality, which can come in quite handy if you've got a lot of these. And oftentimes, uh, when you start a dashboard project, you don't necessarily know what your key performance indicators are going to be. Uh, approaching a project with mashups as a starting point is always a good way to do it. Figure out the metrics uh, that they want, let the user play with it a bit, get their feet wet, and then maybe go and refine this later into a full performance dashboard like the one I showed you before. Some other things that are neat about this, um, you notice there's a share and a bookmark button. You can certainly save your own view that you've created or even share it and send it to somebody else. See, I can also full screen these uh, if I want to see one in detail. As I said, you can have as many of these as you want. Another thing that's also interesting is the ability to put several of these side by side. So this is sales for Asia. If I wanted to see two different dates side by side, I can. Um, or I even hit a parameter and it will push out the same value to all the other controls. So pretty flexible for your end user. The next one I'm going to show you, and I'm hoping some of you guys will actually follow along here, is our mobile uh, dashboard viewing capabilities. So if you go to mobile.dundas.com, uh, especially good if you do it on an iPad, uh, you can actually see uh, what I'm about to show you for yourself. So everything here is tile-based. So the reason we use tiles is that you can actually have some intelligence behind these. Notice how three of these are red. It's red because there's actually some logic here that says, all right, the dashboard underneath this has you know, some condition that's triggering it to draw my attention. So as I just said, there is a dashboard underneath every one of these tiles. If I click on net sales by category, it'll actually take me to the full dashboard. So I'm hoping you can see the power here. I am looking at this home screen at really a summarization of, let's say, 10 different dashboards, just showing at a very high level whether or not there's a notification that's being pushed to the surface. I can also customize this. If I click Customize, you'll see I can move certain elements around. Maybe some are more important than others. Uh, remove ones that maybe aren't useful to my business. So it's all based on whoever logs in. You can even hit Explore and go find other dashboards that you might want to add to this. Another option. Um, so let's just say you're in an office uh, on the ground floor. If you want to get information in front of people, uh, having it buried in a bookmark somewhere in their browser isn't very useful. Why not have dashboards up on a big widescreen display, you know, 50-inch television, showing the information, having it in their face so they can see it every day, what they need. So this is obviously just a screenshot, but I'm going to show you an actual slideshow dashboard that we've created. So this one's a little bit small. Typically, this would be full screen. And you'd simply be showing everything that you need. Uh, this one's designed to be completely hands-off. And what you're seeing right now is an assembly line. So it's actually showing me whether or not certain plants are running. Um, it's a bit random in terms of data, so none of those happen to go red. But if something went down, it would have. You see it just transitioned to another dashboard. So this is showing production information. So notice the selected area on the bottom left is actually automatically highlighting different plants and showing them directly. So all hands off. But you could certainly do this with a smart board where maybe the user can pause or interact with it if you had a touch screen. Here's one where we're actually showing shipping information. So you know, planes moving around the world, where's the current location? Uh, I'm going to come back to this map in a little bit, so I won't dig into too much detail here. But hopefully you can see why the slideshow uh, side of things is really useful just to get information into people's faces. Right? You can't miss it when it's up on the screen all the time. So most dashboards uh, that people tend to create are pretty much going to be full of charts, right? Bar charts, line charts, and areas. In fact, best practices dic dictate that you're using those about 80% of the time. So what I want to explore here is some of the things that you can do with maps and diagrams that I very seldom see. First thing I'm going to show you is what's called a chloroplast map. Uh, we call this simple shape binding. And it really is the most basic type of map out there. You take some kind of land mass, and based on your data, you're just coloring it. So in this case, I'm actually coloring the sail, as you can see from the legend. You don't have to necessarily show, like in my case, it's states by the United States. You could have a world-level view. You could have county, zip code, you name it. If you have geographical data, you can show it on a map. This sample here uh, is a dashboard that's available on our gallery. 
Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is there's some functionality here that is very seldom, or very often, sorry, overlooked. I uh, notice there's a little show map button at the top of the screen. What this actually allows me to do is drill in and select more detail that I want to see. So right now, um, if you have latitude and longitude uh, for anything, maybe you want to show where your clients are, uh, where your stores are around the world, anything that you have that's geographical, you can pin them directly on a map. Here you'll see I can select different metrics that I want to see, and it'll recolor everything. Maybe I want to drill down now. I want to see what's happening in Bakersfield. I can actually click on that, and you'll see that the parent dashboard is now pointing at pa Bakersfield to show you that data. So symbols are something very useful to see on a map. Great for distributions if you want to see where things are located, um, or just quick information about where everything is. Pathbinding. So uh, oftentimes we tend to do this on the shipping side of things. I want to see, you know, we're shipping from one location, how many different routes do we have out of it? Again, great for distribution. You can certainly tie information to the lines, so you can have thickness and color changing depending on the data. This isn't necessarily the best way from a visual standpoint in terms of best practices, but again, great for distribution. If you want to see just your coverage area very quickly, good luck doing that on a simple data grid, which most people do on text reports. So certainly getting that visual is a lot better. Now what I'm going to do here, I have to load this sample directly because it tends to expire just because uh, once things are done, uh, it becomes a little boring. You'll see in a second. But here's a simple airline map that we've created. This is the one that I pulled out of the slideshow. So think about what you're seeing here. This is actually showing planes flying from point A to point B, obviously accelerated, otherwise you wouldn't see much movement here. But it's actually showing how long it's going to take for something to arrive. You could have this uh, attached to GPS device. Maybe you're showing shipping around the world. What you'll see is, though, as a plane arrives at the destination, it disappears from the map. That's why I wanted to load this one as it happened, because uh, I don't think anyone wants to see this with nothing moving or no planes on it. But as I said, anything can be shown here. If you've got GPS coordinates, you can show them. You know where someone is. Why not see it directly on a map? I think this is really cool. Now, sometimes just seeing things high level on a map isn't really enough. Um, our map was designed with the purpose of doing simple data visualization. Uh, there are billion dollar map vendors out there. Uh, Microsoft provides Bing Maps. So what we've actually done in this case is we've taken Bing Maps and we've embedded it into our dashboard platform. You can do this too, or if we can certainly help you uh, if you want to get our professional services involved. But what you're seeing right now is, well, we've gone to the US Census and we're showing eight minutes of earthquake data. Personally, I had no idea that there were this many earthquakes taking place within a basically a random day over a random time period. You see, I can see the concentration of it. I can use my mouse to really deeply zoom in on here and see the points and actually get specifics. Certain areas I might want not want to live anymore now that I'm looking at real estate. But if you're looking for any deep information, um, why not take things even further with a map? It doesn't necessarily just have to be high level. Or even go from one visualization to another. Maybe you drill down from you know, a simple bar chart, and then we show a map. It doesn't necessarily have to be your starting point. Diagrams. So again, using our map control. I know you're probably thinking, well, I don't deal in oil or pipelines. This isn't going to be useful to me. Uh, the reality is everybody has some kind of process. Whether you're a lawyer, you know, in finance, people processes, you can show those directly. Maybe you want to see where bottlenecks are taking place. You name it, it can be there. So these maps can be stadium maps. It could be anything that we're showing as a diagram. This one obviously is showing pipeline from different locations as things are moving. Again, accelerated in real time. But you can see based on the colors who's lagging and who's you know, performing. Here's a simple floor plan. Maybe you have a call center and you want to see who's on the phone or just you know, usage. Or in my case, assigning random values to people in cubicles. This makes people around the office really happy. So again, anything. That's the whole idea behind this. This could actually be hooked up to your phone system if you were in the case of a call center. Maybe you want to see it directly. You don't necessarily have to be storing that data. You can certainly hook into third-party systems. Here's an injury diagram. 
What if you're a manufacturing side of things, or you want to do sports, and you want to see where certain people are getting injured? Sure, you could show it in a simple data grid, but I think it's a lot more useful to see it directly on the body, where concentration of injuries are taking place. You see, I can even filter this, maybe on different projects, or whatever you want to see. So really good at just identifying safety information, things like that. So I showed you a bunch of different maps, diagrams. Now I'm going to jump into some of the things uh, that you can do with charting. As I said, everybody does the simple bars, lines, areas. Uh, I'm not going to focus on the exotic types of charts, but I'm going to show you how you can take the basics and make it a lot more useful. So the first one I want to show you is something called cycle plots. Uh, in my several years of experience, I think I've run into one person who knew, actually knew what this was. So I'm going to explain this as if nobody's seen it. So if you can draw your eyes to the chart in the top of the screen, uh, what you're seeing is, let's just say it's a simple revenue for time for a company. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. In July, every July, for the four years that I'm showing here, what's the trend? Is July a stable month? Does it change a lot? It's a pretty hard question to ask if you just lay it out like this, because I have to move my eye a lot. Right? There's a first July point, second, third, fourth, and so on. You'd have to remove those points mentally and somehow get a picture of it. Very tough. With the cycle plot, it actually uh, groups the data monthly. So this first data point you're seeing in January, that's January 2006. Second one is 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. So what you can get out of that, January and February, I can see really clearly, they're pretty stable months. They don't change all that much. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's your sales cycle. If you're a gardener, probably not doing a lot of sales in January and February. Whereas your August, September, all over the place. Maybe you're doing some serious growth. But it certainly shows that trend a lot clearer than just a simple bar chart. Here's another one, line charts. As I said, 80% of the time you're going to be using these on your dashboards if you're following best practices. This allows you to take things one step further. So I'm going to ask you a quick question. Uh, see this valley we're seeing here? What's the average? I'm sure no one would be able to tell me this. Uh, what you can do is you can actually use your mouse in this case. We've hooked it up so that as I make a selection, it shows the average before, after, sorry, before, during, and then after. So actually interacting with the chart you're seeing and getting information. It could have any formula being shown here. It's up to you. Here's another one. This is showing power uh, usage for various buildings. So I can select the building that I want to see. Okay, it wasn't very interesting data. I want to analyze this peak that we're seeing here. Again, using selection with my mouse, very quickly drops on things like total, average, high, low, any relevant information that you need to do your job. So why not have these sort of calculations built into the dashboard? The whole point is to be able to take action on what you're seeing, not just see it. See, from there I can actually go on and drop things like a minimum, maximum line on here, just more information. Now, dashboards. Many businesses build web portals around their dashboards. Um, they help users navigate the data that they need to see. Right? Think of going out and buying SharePoint or just building something custom. Custom web development is really expensive. So why not design a navigation in Dundas dashboard? You can save a lot of time and money. You may have noticed that I popped into here very quickly uh, when I was going through one of the earlier samples. This is a portal that we created in order to navigate just all the material that we need uh, when we're showing information to our clients. So you could do the same. Maybe you want to have dashboards for different departments. If I click on one of these, it'll bring up the information that I need. There's a slide I showed you with a big screen TV. So it's just a quick navigation portal directly in a dashboard. I don't use PowerPoint for anything. I use dashboards. They're live. I can have live data in there. Why not? Another one that I'm going to show you, sorry, this is a little bit out of order, is predictive analytics. So you can actually have charts, gauges, anything you want, responding to inputs of variables. Let me show you what I mean by that. So now that you've had a second to see this, it, at the top of the screen, these are various inputs that you've got. So this is built for a transportation company. People who are buying cars, maybe Avis, it could be anyone. Right, as the fleet size increases, 
see what happens to the various metrics that we're tracking here. The annual budget went up. As I increase uh, just the average, you know, maybe I'm going to buy some new cars. If they have better fuel economy, again, CO2, well, in that case, went up because I was going the wrong direction. I can bring it back down. As fuel prices go up and down, same thing. So it's all about inputting information that you have and seeing the results. So it's all rule-based. This is a little bit more difficult to build because you really have to understand your business and the end results. And this is certainly something that we help people do every day in our professional services department. So if this is something you want to get to, uh, give us a call. We can help you. I'm actually going to show you a full dashboard now. And this is a debut for this one. Nobody's seen this yet. And it's basically completely based on predictive analytics. So I'll give you a second to absorb this. There's a lot of information on the screen. And then I'll explain it. All right, so picture yourself uh, in the role of a plant manager. You're making cars, so it's a factory. And the plant's about, the ship's about to start. You're being told at the top of the screen that you need to build 700 vehicles. So I can see right there. Our current output is 394. So we're going to fall short. Why are we falling short? Because we, we had a lot of people call in sick. We don't have enough forklifts, things like that. So. I'm hypothetically basing this on staffing. I know for those of you who are actually in this industry, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but I need this to, uh, to be relevant to everybody as well. So what you're seeing in the bottom of the screen, uh, we can build right now 0 0.91 vehicles per minute, all because we're missing some people. So you notice there's a bit of a gray area here where it shows a handful of people missing. Let's go and add them. So I need some forklift drivers. Here's a list of everybody I could call in. I'm going to start by calling in Emmanuel Watson. Uh, he's only got two overtime hours, so I'll call him in before the shift and get him working. Maybe I'll call some students in as well, just because they're probably cheaper than full-time employees. You see, once I do that, the uh, plant starts to speed up, 1.1 vehicles per minute, because we've met that minimum in terms of what we needed. I'm going to do the same now quickly for machinists and line operators. Add a few people. There we go. Again, speeding up the shift for the plant. Now let's add some line operators. Now once I've filled that problem of staffing, you'll notice now that we're actually building more than enough cars uh, to meet the need. In fact, we're overdoing it by a little bit. I could potentially not bring in everybody. But you may have noticed that the bottom of the screen has suddenly gone red. What this is, I never did explain this chart, is this is actually showing the status of the plant. So when the shift starts at 8 a.m., green light means we're running. So we're going to run all the way till 10, no problem. 10 o'clock we have a break, goes to lunch, quick lunch break, and then the afternoon uh, half starts. At the end of the shift, we actually run out of parts. So you can see that here in the middle of the screen. We're building three different models of vehicles. So model A, that's the requirement, the yellow or orange bar that you're seeing. The horizontal, or ver sorry, vertical marker that you've got there is the actual number of parts we have available. So you can see in the morning, we actually end up eating a lot of parts that were required for the afternoon shift. But in the afternoon, we don't have enough parts for Model C to cover the requirement. So what do I do? Well, a very simple thing is just change the ratio. We don't want everybody, you know, they're going to be here anyway until 4 o'clock. We might as well have them building cars for us. So I'm actually going to click on Fine Tune Production, which will allow me to go in and actually change uh, the ratios that I'm seeing here. So this section shows the charts a little bit more, sorry, the parts a little bit more granular. Engines, axles, powertrains, and chassis. We just happen to have an equal number of each, but if we didn't, uh, we still need to meet the minimum that is available. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to build more Model A's. And you see, as I start changing that ratio, slowly we are able to run out or have enough Model C's that we actually fill the need for the shift. You see, when I close that, Shift runs, and we've solved the problem. We're building the number of cars we were told to build. Everything's running. We've solved our staffing issue. Now I, all I have to do is actually go and call these people in. So I would click on Show Production Schedule, print this off, and I have a list of phone numbers and everything that I have to go do and bring these guys in to you know, do the job. So we're a great planning dashboard. Very seldom have I seen one that goes to this depth in terms of just allowing you to take action. So hopefully you like this.
All right, uh, now the, side, the customization and flexibility side of things uh, that I promised. Uh, when we first announced this webinar, uh, we said, hey, we're going to show you just how flexible then this dashboard is. And uh, One of the more cheeky uh, clients we had uh, sent us an email and said, yeah, if you're so flexible, why don't you build a game in this dashboard? Forget about dashboards. Show me what else you can do in there. It's a development platform. You know, basically, you throw me a requirement, I can do it. That's really our mantra here. And you'll see what I've done. I'm going to log into Dundas Dashboard. And now I'm going to sit here and play Tetris, built completely in Dashboard using scripts. So there are no outside components required here. Jeff? Jeff? Well, guys, it looks like we lost them, so I guess this is as good a time as any to uh, wrap up the webinar. I see that we still have some unanswered questions, so we'll get to those. If your question isn't answered, know that we will email you shortly afterwards with an answer to your question. And we will also be sending out the YouTube link to everyone who was here today. So thank you again. Uh, like I said, we will be playing Tetris and answering questions for another few minutes. But uh, the webinar is now officially over. Thank you.